This is the Crash MotoGP podcast, episode 19 for our Aragon Grand Prix preview. I'm your host, Harry Benjamin. Alongside me, Keith Hewin and Pete McLaren. And on today's show, well, I've already given it away, really. We are going to be looking ahead to what may lie in store for us with MotoGP back in Aragon this weekend. We'll also be discussing a little bit on track limits. I can almost hear the cheers from Pete and Keith. Uh, but it's caused uproar once again, uh, this time in the World Superbikes at Manly Corps. But as we all know, it's a repetitive issue throughout MotoGP and motorsport in general. Uh, plus, I dread to think of the season where Maverick Vinales isn't in the headlines every Every week, what on earth would we talk about? Because, of course, after his debut on the Aprilia at Misano for a private test, the team has announced Maverick is back for Aragon and will be racing with the team this weekend. So, let's get straight into it, shall we, team? Uh, Keith Vinales, good run out in the uh, Aprilia at Misano. Revealed his lap time, a 133.0. Nothing but positive feedback, which you'd hope to expect anyway, but uh, so good that they decided to bump off Lorenzo Savadori and uh, in comes Maverick back on the bike. Imagine how Andrea Iannone feels at this point in time. He's finally, definitely not coming back to Aprilia. Um, I mean, the positives. The positives are damn good times that, that Vinales has done on a brand new bike to him. So I think we've got to take our hats off there. But don't you feel that we've been here so many times before with Vinales in testing in any of those situations where pre-season he always looks really, really quick and like he's going to have a great year. And I just get the feeling this time, I had to stifle a bit of a yawn in your intro there with that, not because of you, but because of the subject, in as much as we are questioning straight away, is he going to do it? Is he going to come back and do it? I don't think it'd be any, I think to a man, I, don't, I think... To see him perform and to see him perform to his true potential on an Aprilia at Aragon, where he goes quite good anyway, um, would be a great thing for everybody, for the sport, for him, for Aprilia particularly. Um, and I hope he does. But excuse me for being the eternal cynic that I've always been in, that, that, that we've seen Maverick perform. His first few rides on the Yamaha um, in testing and then at the beginning of the year in races were really, really good. And then it seems to descend into this sort of, incredible head war that he has with himself and I'm hoping that the change of garage and the change of um, personnel will just lift him enough to keep that momentum going in the second half of the season there's no there's you know no one's going to give him any quarter you know it's just, he's got the same problems on the Aprilia as he's got with the Yamaha it's the com competition it's everyone around him it's the it's the situation that he finds himself in that he's going to be in again on a different motorbike you know, is the Aprilia better than Yamaha? No, it definitely isn't. Not on present form that we've seen so far. Is the Aprilia improving? Have they made a step? Yes, they have. And a massive one, of course. You know, Aleish last time out was brilliant. First podium for him in what, in the Premier class, something like seven years. When was the last time an Aprilia had a podium in the Premier class? We've got to go back to probably, I mean, I know I should have looked it up, but I haven't. But it'll be someone like Jeremy McWilliams, won't it? I would think. I mean, Pete's nodding, so I might be near to being right. Um, I'm, not, I'm not great on stats. That's why we rely on everyone else. But will he do it? I hope he does. Um, it's going to be tough at Aragon. Aragon is not an easy racetrack. Um, the Aprilia is fast enough. It looked really stable. Last time out, I was really impressed with how stable it was. And I think it will go well at Aragon this year. Um, will Vinales be in the top half dozen? If he does, it will be something like a miracle, I think, is, is my thinking. Yeah, well, lots of questions have uh, come in from uh, our beloved listeners on this. You've answered uh, Babe's one already. He, he's thinking exactly the same thing as you. Is it not something we've just seen before, hoping it might be a different story this time around for Maverick? Uh, Callum's asked, though, do you think Vinales has just seen something in Aprilia that everyone else has missed? Because I know we, they're an improving bike, but are they about to make this gigantic step forward in their development of the bike that will bring them suddenly to becoming regular front-running contenders? There are no gigantic steps. This is incremental. We are in a prototype situation here with all of these bikes. There will be some gigantic steps come 2022 when the freeze, the, the technical freeze is lifted. Mm. Um, but there are no gigantic steps. My worry is, is whether the Aprilia improves with the current motorbikes, but they're two-year-old motors now, really, basically, in technical terms. Um, so Aprilia is only really catching up to what was, was already two years old, if you like. Um, so 
it's incremental. It really is. I mean, it's finding those tiny, tiny little details. Again, we will talk about World Superbike in a minute because we can't not. And <laughs> watching how those guys went through getting tiny details right from race to race. Obviously, they have three races, one on Saturday and two on Sunday, although bizarrely they don't call one of them a race on Sunday. I don't know what that's all about. But anyway, it's another thing we can moan about. But um, it, it just seems to me that, that, that these incremental changes. Now, Maverick Vinales seems to go through the whole data log um, to try and find what he needs sometimes. Some weekends, I think that you know every man in Yamaha is running around in a bloody great circle trying to work out exactly what they need to give to Maverick Vinales to get him to perform. You know, from day to day, it could be completely different from Maverick. You will find him qualify, not qualify particularly well, but go really well in free practice. And then it sort of descends into chaos where they can't quite work out why he's not able to hook the rear up or make it work in the way he wants it to do. Um, these are the same problems he's going to have in Aprilia. There's, there's, change of manufacture isn't going to make a difference, I don't believe, to the, to the problems he still has to sort out uh, throughout every weekend. Hope he does. I hope it works for Aprilia and for him. It'd be brilliant. It'd be, it'd be the biggest story of the year if he dumps Yamaha, goes to Aprilia, and then ends up on the podium this weekend. If that happens, well, oh. I'm just thinking of what I can publicly eat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough, I don't think, don't, for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll well, get a few Pete, hits online. Yeah, 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 it would do. Pete, let's bring you in the, on this as well, because I was reading, I think, one of your articles on, on Crash.net about this. And, you know, the, the positive uh, feedback coming out of the initial private test in Misano was, was perhaps, you know, it wasn't a given, given that he spent most of his career with this inline engine. Maverick might have not had such a good feeling straight away on the Aprilia, a very different kind of bike. But this positive feedback, the good timings in the testing that he's revealed, it's all looking fairly good. Yeah, as you say, Harry, he, he was, his words, nervous about trying the V4 engine. As you say, the Suzuki and the Yamaha before had the inline force. He wasn't quite sure how that might feel. Would he get on with it? But he said he was pleasantly surprised by it. Um, the Aprilia technical director, Romano Abassiano, was saying the similar sort of things. There'd been no major issues. So, it, you know, it's, it's, it's encouraging full stop that he wants to race at the, the earliest possible time, isn't it? Because I think given the season that he's had at Yamaha, these, these sort of highs and lows, you know, emotionally, if you like, that, that maybe he might have been discouraged against, you know, wanting to come back. So the fact that this is basically the, the first chance he's got to get on and race the bike and he's taken it. So that shows that he's still got, you know, the enthusiasm for this new project. So I think that hopefully is a good sign in itself. For, for the things that Keith was talking about that, you know, he's got a, he, and he was also saying in fairness to him that he knows he needs to make this, he knows he needs to make this chance work. You know, he, he's got to get, he's got to get it right at the pretty, he's got to, you know, drive forward and push this project forward. And, you know, he's joining a pretty at, at a great time. You know, the bike's just been on the podium. Alesha was what, four seconds off victory on 20 laps, what 0.2 of a second a lap, you know, it's, it, it couldn't be a better time. And as you guys have been saying, imagine if he goes and does something special on this bike. I mean, we know already this year it's been too sporadic, you know, but there's been times, Qatar and Assam, where on the same bike he's been as quick as, as Fabio Quattararo. You know, so we know he can do it. It's just that he can, he's not able to do it weekend in, weekend out. Things, as Keith was saying, things just just seem to, you know, some small thing will happen and it just derails his whole weekend. But he's got the speed there. And who knows, you know, there is the chance to make this history for Aprilia. You know, they've got the podium now. They've never won a race in the Premier class. And, and who knows, you know, if he goes on and does that, it could be a, a massive shock. We haven't seen a, a, a top rider, a rider, you know, he's a nine-time winner. We saw Ian only join Aprilia, but Ian only had one win and, you know, masses of talent. But, he, you know, he had, didn't have the track record, that say, that, that Maverick had. Maverick's only 26 still as well. He's relatively young. So, you know, we haven't seen this kind of big move, I, I guess, maybe. I mean, Caparossi, when he went from Ducati to Suzuki, but he was a lot later in his career. But then you'd have to go back to Rossi, really, from, from Honda to Yamaha. And, you know, nobody, the Yamaha had only taken one podium the previous year. So in that sense, you know, the Aprilia has now taken one podium. It's not too far apart. And it would just be, you know, it's another great twist for the season. It's another story that, you know, a top line rider joins what what is on paper, the the lowest of the manufacturers and, and let's see what he can do. And, you know, will the big question is, as Keith has been saying, will this change of atmosphere, you know, revive Maverick and really reset him and bring him back to, to kind of the guy he was at Suzuki, 
where in his second year at Suzuki, he was consistent. He was, you know, up there every week, pretty much in the top six. He won a race and everything else. So that's what we'll all be looking for. He didn't want to leave Suzuki, did he? He took a long time to go to Yamaha. The Yamaha move was the right move, but he did not want to go from Suzuki. There was something about that sort of care that Davide Brivio and that team gave him in Suzuki that really made him reluctant to take the Yamaha deal. It's funny, you know, I've probably been in the past a little bit harsh over the situation at Aprilia. Bear in mind that I have no uh, hand in that camp at all. Um, but you take on their second riders always seem to come off really second best. They never seem to quite, you know, come out of it with any kind of decent deal at the end of the day. Everyone that we've had, the fact that we've had a couple of Brits in there, of course, we, we're slightly more sensitive to perhaps here in Britain. But seeing the Vizioso line up for photographs with the team this week to congratulate them on the podium gives me great heart. That almost suddenly has a, it has the Ducati Italian kind of feel about it, the family kind of feel. Now, if that is how that team actually is and not as harsh as it has appeared to be in the past, that will be a positive for Maverick Vinales. That will assist him mentally with what he's doing and, and how he will perform. Because everything, everything once you get to this stage is north of the eyebrows. There's, you know, all of these guys can ride a motorbike the best in the world. There's, you know, that's it. Everything else is done you know, cerebrally, it's it's done automatically. It's something that, you know, they work on it. Their, their psychology is very important. And that's where Mavericks is perhaps a little weak. Now, if it's a, a team that has a team spirit similar to the Suzuki team, um, and I I and many others have been wrong about how harsh it always appears that Aprilia treat their number two, if you like. Not that I'm considering Maverick Vinales to be a number two. We'll get to Alasia in a minute because I think it's going to be fireworks at some stage. They are mates, but at the end of the day, uh, in a team situation... As soon as you feel like you're coming out as the number two, then that's when it all kicks off. So they're going to have to do a really good job of keeping it all together neat and tidy. But I just think that the Davizioso thing was was really quite neat, how he kind of turned up and congratulated the team on the podium. He's been doing a little bit of work with them. We really don't know how much. The quality of Davizioso is that he doesn't make public statements. Battistella, his, his manager, doesn't make public statements. They're a very close business unit that, that kind of do their business behind the scenes and get on with it. And I, I kind of quite like that. It's got a professional ring about it that I quite like. Um, they're not throwing their hands in the air or, or chucking out little snippets to the press left, right and centre if they can. And the fact that now Davizioso is all freed off to go and play at Petronas on a, on a Yamaha for the rest of the year as well. I mean, this is the gift that keeps giving, isn't it? I mean, it's just, <laughs> Maverick has really freed off quite an interesting second half of the year for, for Dovi as well. It's, it's going to be a really interesting few races. They really are. I think on that, right, Keith, the, the point you raise about the, the, the second rider, and Alasia's brought up Massimo Rivola arriving to the team is really changing things. Now, he obviously arrived after we saw the, you know, the, the Sam Lowe's and, and Scott Reddy. I mean, I remember going to the pits to see Lowe's and things like that. And the atmosphere, as you say, was just, you could, you could cut it with a knife. I mean, it, it was a really, you could see that people just didn't want to be there. Uh, and they weren't even speaking, I think, certain parts of the team and, and things like that. Uh, you know, Aleish has, has credited Rivola, and I think with, with, you know, improving a lot of things in all areas with Aprilia. And I think that he will have a really important role to play as far as, as Maverick's situation for, for, for the reasons that you mentioned there. And also just a little bit on Dovi. I, I've got to think, you know, we don't know because they were private tests how quick he was going on the Aprilia. But as you say, knowing Dovi and the way that he would, you know, look at things and he must have been done pretty well on that Aprilia to make him think, you know what? I can come back next year and I can be competitive. You know, I think that if he was going around and he was several seconds off the pace, you know, of a leisure or off the bike, I think, I think Dobby would have thought, you know what, it, it, it's over. I think that he probably saw during those tests, because he did, what, three, four tests? One of them was rained a bit, but that, that he saw what he needed to see to tell himself, you know, yeah, I can, I can still do this. I think that that... That may be played a part also. We don't know, as I say, private tests, they're not like official tests. Official tests, we get all the lap times, don't we? And we can see things, um, you know, when the lap time was set, which is also this thing with Vinales. As he said, as you mentioned, Harry, 33-0 was the first day. The second day, I checked with the pretty, it, was, it went down to a 32-4, which right. basically matches his, his, um, his race-winning lap with the Yamaha. Now, but we don't know. Was that done with a brand brand new tires, zero fuel, you know, a two lap run, or or did it come at the end of a, a 20 lap race simulation or something? You know, there's a there's a big difference there in, in when that lap time is set. 
So there's still a lot of questions, but either way, you know, as you've mentioned, it's a competitive lap time and it, it, it just sets things up for, you know, what's he going to do this weekend at Aragon? We have spoken a lot, though, about the mental health uh, around Maverick Vinales at Yamaha. And it's interesting that he has so quickly said, you know, this is the happiest he's ever been in MotoGP. So th- that does, you know, p- tie in perhaps with your your thinking about, you know, the pictures of the Vizioso and the Italian vibe. But Keith, you're looking like you don't agree with that sentiment whatsoever. I just think it's too soon. He hasn't been put under well, pressure yet. You know, the, yeah. the, the, the situation is, I mean, it's, it's funny that you, you mentioned... Rivola, yeah, he came through from Formula One. Davide Brivio went to Alpine in Formula One. You know, we're talking about that kind of level of management. So, Albesiano, you mentioned him a little earlier, Pete. I mean, Albesiano always looks like a guy that I wouldn't trust if I was buying a second-hand car off him. I'm sure that's not the case, but kind of. <laughs> he kind of seems to say things that, that are great for, for, for the media, Um but really, promises that were made to to riders in the past, you're right, pre Rivola, have not kind of come to fruition. Uh, you mentioned Sam Lowe's earlier on. Sam Lowe's manager, we talked about this on the last podcast, was uh, Roger Burnett. Uh, Roger Burnett did a lot of due diligence before Sam signed for Aprilia. There were a lot of promises made. Um, nothing has been made public afterwards of what happened and why it all went pear shaped. But now, Ali, the little factory is, is quite a small factory. I, just just wind it back to when Patronus were coming on board. Yamaha needed to know exactly what was going on engineering-wise in June. No later. I think it was the 26th of June. I don't know why that date fits in my mind, but there's something like there was a date in June. The cutoff was we cannot prepare another set of bikes for the following year after the after this June deadline. The engineering and the the, the preloading of all their engineering and all their their bits and pieces they need to get in line to get bikes ready for the following year is that far in advance so is it any surprise that that Aprilia perhaps struggled a bit keeping up with their promises of 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 new motors faster motors this that and the other sure they will have had a, a motor on the bench that looked like it was going really really well but to convert that into something that you know arrives at the racetrack race ready ready to go and 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 that will stick together and won't throw its lunch up at the first opportunity at the end of the straight it's it's a it's a big engineering thing to to produce a prototype motorbike. Look at Suzuki, Valencia and Suzuki when their brand new MotoGP bike came out. All it did was cough its guts up. It was going great in testing, but as soon as you put it in the hands of a, I was I was going to say real racer. Of course, their testers are real racers as well. Um, but the point being is is that the boys that would wring its neck for for the last ounce of of power out of it on, on a track, even like Valencia, which you wouldn't have thought it would have exploded there, but they did. They went pop. I remember it was really difficult for Suzuki that first time. And we all went, Oh my God, you know, poor Suzuki, what have they done? They've come back to MotoGP and now they're, are they ever going to get it together? And here we are now they're, you know, potential race winners. Um, it's tough job engineering prototypes in this environment to a rule book. Remember as well, that's the other thing. They can't just do whatever they want. They've got to stick to the parameters of a rule book. And and that in itself, even though you've got V4s, inline fours, you know, different bits and pieces hanging all over, you've got spec electronics now, you can't do anything with them. They're all exactly the same. And if you want to do anything that's a bit wild, anything that's a bit different, it's got to be agreed by all the other manufacturers. You can't just uh, produce some something. Um, Ducati seem to, and just about get away with it um, quite often. is a bit clever. And uh, manages to produce something that um, no one else is, which is within the rules, and gets away with it. I keep thinking of the scoop on the back, the aerodynamic, the tire cooler, as uh, it was <laughs> originally uh, labelled before it was recognised as an aerodynamic thing. Anyway, that's another story. I'm sure we can go on for a whole new podcast <laughs> on that one, Gary. Another day. Well, I'm starting well, to head all... off. I can feel myself heading off. Yeah, I'll, bre- I'll come in now. What this all means, of course, obviously, is that Lorenzo Savadori has uh, lost his seat, the rookie, who uh, I'm just looking at the standings now. He's 24th currently with uh, four points on the board. So he's been relegated down to uh, Test Rider and some wildcard entries. So a word on, on Savadori, because obviously, you know, he has been completely outpaced by Alicia Sparker, but in his rookie season, but he's, been looking, but it, he's, he's been looking good, Harry. I mean, I think yeah. that there has been an improvement from Savadori. I think it's always a bit cruel when someone comes in as a as a as part of the team and, and gets ousted straight away in these exceptional circumstances. Uh, I feel a bit sorry for Savadori, but 
hey, welcome to the real world. <laughs> You're not going to turn down a, a Vinales who's on offer, uh, are you? One word from both of you, though, from Simon. He asks this, will Vinales surprise us all this coming weekend? Yes or no? Yes. I'm going with a yes. Yeah, I mean, it depends where, <laughs> surprise in what way, doesn't it? But yes, there'll be a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> a good or a bad surprise. That was from Simon. Well, as you ever, Maverick Vinales dominating the headlines. Uh, also, uh, we've got um, uh, Jake Dixon back in the Petronas Yamaha seat for Aragon as well, which of course have set a, uh, a few dominoes off as well because John McPhee is finally uh, getting a chance as, uh, in his place in the Moto2 uh, campaign there. So good news all round for, for both those riders. Yeah, it seems like it fell in his lap, really, Jake. I don't think he was scheduled for it at all, was he, Pete? I think that um, the other rider, uh, Xavi Vierge, I think, was was scheduled for it. And uh, for some strange reason, he knocked it back, which, you know, whether, whether um, you know, Jake had been sticking pins in an effigy of him or something yeah. and gave him a bad feeling about riding a MotoGP bike. But it's a great opportunity for Jake. I mean, he rode it really well at Silverstone. I mean, he's under the pressure of a home Grand Prix, a track like Silverstone, which is massively fast and wide. Uh, Aragon, you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a big fan of Aragon. It was uh, one of those tracks that I was always worried about that would drop off the end of the Spanish um, list of uh, favoured tracks because um, I think that that racetrack is a, it's a great racetrack. It's in a great place. It's fantastic to go to. Plenty of viewing places. I, I love the place. Yeah, I mean, we all thought Xavi Vieje would be on the bike this weekend. As, as you say, Keith, he seems to have turned it down. It seems to be the rumour, which is sort of, Bit of a surprise, isn't it? it? It's a strange one. I mean, Vieja, if he has, it's sort of the second time a MotoGP rider sort of come by and he's just missed out. You remember he rode for Tectoire for sort of many years in Moto2 and, and was really impressive with them. You know, their chassis wasn't the best at the time. He was top five in the dry, he got a podium in the wet. And then, but, you know, he thought, I need to get a Calix chassis to, to take that next step. And so he left the team. And at the time, they just signed Zarco and Folger. They just had their first year in MotoGP. So it didn't look like there was any room in the MotoGP team. And then what happened? Folger withdrew, didn't he? He phoned up Hervé in January and said, I'm not coming back. Suddenly, they need a MotoGP rider. And if Vieje hadn't have left the team only, what, two months before, not even that, he would have been the guy to move straight up into that ride that eventually went to Javi Sarin. So he sort of narrowly missed out there on a MotoGP chance. And it seems now, for whatever reason, maybe you know, what one thought is that the team were basically up front with him and said, look, you're not in the running for the, for the seat next year with the team, you know, to, so this will be a one-off chance for you. And I think he thought, given the, the spec of the bike, that maybe there was more to lose than to gain or whatever, but we've spoken before, you know, it's a, for a young rider to turn down a MotoGP chance. We saw what Jake Dixon did at, at Silverstone. You know, I think we all agree he, you know, he came out of the weekend, you know, higher up on the list of probability or, or his chances of getting a MotoGP ride than, than before it. So, you know, it's a big thing to do if he has turned it down. But either way, Jake has, has got this chance. It, it seems as they were satisfied with his performance and they'll give him this this other chance. Now, we don't know. You know, it seems like a head-to-head -head between Jake and Darren Binder for this the race seat next year. We don't quite know the way the team's thinking, you know, which one of them is maybe ahead. Some people say that Darren is still, you know, the clear favourite. Others say, well, it's a bit, you know, a bit closer after Silverstone. But... I think, you know, if Jake can pick up where he left off, well, at least left off after warm up, let's say, you know, where he was 1.6 seconds off and then it sort of all went wrong in the race. But if he can can pick up from there, it's a similar lap time, Aragon, one minute 50, another, you know, Silverstone was two minutes. As Keith says, it's a great track, not not completely different from Silverstone. It's got fast corners. It's a, a big flowing track. And of course, well, Morbidelli won last year on that bike. So, you know, we know the bike can go well around there so there, everything's there for jake you know to having thought about his debut weekend as keith says he won't have the home pressure you know come back and if he can keep building on that he can make it make it a hard decision for the uh, well current patronus guys and you know for this new team that they'll have next year it is always interesting, isn't it, when a rider turns down a MotoGP seat? It's, you just think, why would you do that if you're, you know, a, a, a young gun trying to get yourself higher up the list? Um, what that has done, though, with uh, Dixon back in, it's uh, meant that now they're giving a chance to John McPhee, who we have spoken a fair bit about uh, throughout the season and, and normally, usually under trying circumstances but this is a good another breakthrough for, for John to, to get a chance in Moto2 again and to have a go on a bigger bike. You know, it's a funny, I have this slight feeling of trepidation here with this as it is at the minute, because 
I think McPhee, again, he finds himself going into a Moto2 team, which is right, and he should. There's the opportunity is there. He's, he's done the right thing to go there. They should have let him have it at Silverstone, in my view. He's not anywhere in the Moto3 Championship. He should have gone up into it uh, at Silverstone. I don't understand why they didn't do that, um, and I've never been out to find out why. But my worry is is that the team, Moto3 and Moto2, for next year is disbanding. This is a this is a, a team that's on the descent. It's it's gonna it's not going to exist next year. Moto two is mega mega competitive. It's a very tight field. You need to have be you need to have the best of everything to make it work. Again, my cynicism just wonders whether the bike will be the best that the John McPhee can ride. I wonder whether Patronus whether they've already given up on the deal regarding Moto two. You know, Jake moving up into into MotoGP, he's trying to battle for his place in MotoGP for 2022 and onwards. Um, I'm just wondering how the bike will fare itself um, and whether the team behind John McPhee will be able to give him what he needs and help him on his way on Moto2. He'll be able to ride it. There's no doubt about it. It'll be interesting to see if he can give us a shock on it. Bloody tough class, though. It's going to be thrown at the deep end, isn't it, Pete? Yeah, I was going to say, interesting. I mean, almost... Is it a bigger step for John going from Moto3 to Moto2 mid-season than it was for Jake to go to MotoGP, given that Jake was a previous British superbike guy? You know, he had that experience. You know, I don't know what, which which do you think is... Uh, I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. right in bringing that up. I think that that was the whole plan with the Triumphs, the 765 Triumphs and the the you know the, the electronic spec package that, that's on them as well. It's all much closer to MotoGP than to Moto3. You know, Moto2 moved up the up the order slightly. And I think that was the whole plan, you know, to, to, to make it technically more difficult, to make it faster, and make it, you know, a bike with a load more grunt than the, the old 600 Hondas had before. So I think, yeah, it's a bigger step from Moto3 to Moto2. Um, not quite as big a step that Darren Binder's, in, 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 you know, doing the Jack Miller and going Moto3 straight through to MotoGP. That's a massive step, <laughs> both technically and physically. Um, <laughs> and I remember Jack, Jack... I don't know whether he put on a load of weight just because it. I don't quite know what happened, but Jack Jack came back. Jack came back a bit fat the next year. I remember thinking. <laughs> I know. I know it's not right to say these things anymore. You're not allowed to, but I just did. He did come back a little bit more bark on him, and 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 it wasn't particularly muscly. And uh, he had to really have a have a word with himself and get himself back into being a proper MotoGP rider. And look what he's. I mean, I, I rate Jack so highly, um, but that was a tough job. Moto three to Moto GP. Um, you're right, Jake Dixon, good superbike rider previously, good on big bikes, you know, got the right kind of body work for it, hasn't he? He's a, a rangy sort of, you know, rossy kind of a build on him. Um, mm. I think it's going. I think it's going to be good for him. I'm looking forward to seeing him at Aragon. I think that he's any nerves that he had, which you won't ever see with Jake, because it's always it comes out as as, as fun and smiles. Um, but he will have been nervous at Silverstone. It would have been playing on him. He would have had a bit of a sleepless sleepless night over it occasionally before that now he's had that behind him he's 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 got used to the bike these boys catch on real quick you know top line motorbike racers catch on very 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 fast so Aragon, you know expect something a little bit better out of um jakey boy there i think it's a it's a result of the fence <laughs> Well, lots of things as ever to watch out for this weekend. We'll uh, we'll come on and talk a little bit more about what to expect at Aragon this weekend uh, in a few moments. But first, uh, let's just sidestep ever so slightly um, because uh, it would be a miss of us not to talk about uh, what happened in World Superbikes at the weekend just gone because we've had many questions come in on it through uh, through our wonderful listeners on on social media on Crashnet socials. So thank you for getting in touch. Um, it's about track limits. So it's not something we're unfamiliar with here. It's it, we talked about it on previous podcasts gone by in terms of, you know, if you do leave the track and you gain advantage, yes, you should be penalized. But if you're not gaining a lasting advantage, should you be penalized uh, as severely for it, which seems to have been the case, Keith, this weekend in the form of Top Rack, who, uh, who lost his Super Bowl win uh, because of a so-called track limits excursion. If you gain an advantage, then yes, you should be penalised. But as many questions have come in, uh, Keith, uh, they feel that this one was particularly unjust. Just talk us through a bit about, about what you saw unfold. 